In the summer of 2013, the national production crew of Antiques Roadshow rolled into the city of Baton Rouge. <laughs> it was a pretty big deal. Roughly 5,000 people jammed into the Baton Rouge River Center with items big and small to see if they were holding on to a treasure or something else. Thanks to the producers of this popular PBS television show, we were given exclusive access to see exactly what goes on behind the scenes. One, two, three, roll! But that's not all. We also followed a pair of huge Antiques Roadshow fans who were getting ready for their big day. So come along for this unique ride of Antiques Roadshow behind the scenes. English professor has held on to her record collection over the years. Growing up in the 50s, Barbara grew up with rock and roll. There was so much bad publicity and um, religious uh, objection, you know, to Elvis. Mm -hmm. And What did you think of rock and roll at the time? Oh, I loved it. <laughs> Barbara's record collection of Elvis, Johnny Cash, and Jerry Lee Lewis, among others, is noteworthy because one of her first jobs out of college was working at the legendary Sun Studio in Memphis, Tennessee for three years. And over the years, Barbara has held on to many Sun Records keepsakes. Barbara, this is a fabulous collection. Thank I mean, you. I'm, I'm a little proud of it myself, Charlie. I'm blown away. <laughs> the, Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins, John Cash. When you see this, which one sticks out? Even some Elvis Presley 45s? Well, I really do think the two um, early Elvis are the most valuable, mm -hmm. possibly, and ones that so many people are interested in. Tell me about but, it. Um, well, th the two things about Mystery Train and uh, Blue Moon of Kentucky is that they do represent what has become sort of a cliche now that um, rockabilly, as this genre of music came to be called, is a blending of country and R&B, of black music and white hillbilly music. And both of them were not considered proper and were not played on regular popular mm -hmm. stations in those days. Barbara also fondly holds on to Sun Record history because she's part of it. She was responsible for writing liner notes for many of the albums. The Carl Perkins was the first one that I wrote. The liner notes to the Carl Perkins right, album. Right. This and was Carl Perkins' first? That was his first album. That was Sun Record Company's first album. Wow. You can do anything for me, half of my blue suede shoes. And if feeling good is uh, therapeutically good, then listening to Carl Perkins is what the doctor ordered. <laughs> that sounds a little corny, but anyhow, <laughs> that always makes me feel good. And Carl said about himself later in his life, um, this is feel-good music. What do you hope Antiques Roadshow appraisers tell you? I haven't thought that far ahead. <laughs> I just thought it was wonderful that I had a ticket. The Chalmette Battlefield is about seven miles downriver from the French Quarter, and this is the historic site of the Battle of New Orleans, the last major fight in the War of 1812. Here, free men of color, Creoles, Acadians, Indians, and even pirate Jean Lafitte and his men defeated the British. Nearly 200 years later, Chuck McMains of Baton Rouge thinks he might have a British musket left behind from the Battle of New Orleans. So Chuck, you are a big fan of Antiques Roadshow? I am. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. The, uh, it always amazes me how many experts they have on mm -hmm. how much they know. So Chuck, this is where you keep the guns? Well, actually, I don't <laughs> for the keep TV them guy, here for right? the TV guy. That's right. <laughs> I love it. All right, tell me about the, the British uh, uh, rifle first. This is a brown best musket that I bought down in an antique store in Royal Street uh -huh. back in the, oh, about 2000, in 2005, before Katrina. But the, the store is no longer in business. 
So this, this was the classic gun of the British Army in the American Revolution, in the French and Indian Wars, and then, of course, in the War of 1812 and the Battle of New Orleans. I, what's the story behind this? The musket? story is that this is what was the way it was sold to me, <laughs> and, and I don't have any reason to disbelieve it. The uh, the antique store owner grew up in a uh, off of the Legion Fields, and at that back in the 19th century, there was an old plantation down there that was next door to where he grew up, and he okay. grew up with those kids. And this this gun had been in the plantation family for many years. And the story was that it was picked up off the battlefield at Chalmette, which is, of course, just a little bit further down, uh, after the Battle of New Orleans. And so that's that's the story. I noticed etchings right there. Look at that. It's that's the crown. Yeah, there yeah. are a number of, uh, of hallmarks on here. Uh, this crown, of course, and you see here tower, that that was that the tower arsenal uh, the, the, from the Tower of London. But that's fairly characteristic. I mean, that, that's nothing, that doesn't necessarily mean, it, it identifies it as a British military weapon, but beyond that, um, it, it doesn't, doesn't help you a whole lot, at least not me. Chuck, what do you hope the Antiques Roadshow folks even say? Money-wise, I don't know. I mean, I know what I spent on this one. I bought this one for 3000 so uh, that, which I think is about right for a, a map market for mm -hmm. a, a brown best musket, and uh, only if it truly came off the battlefield might it, you know, have uh, have some uh, a little bit more value to it. But that's the value, really. I'm just kind of interested in it. The good news for Chuck, it won't be long now until the Antiques Roadshow appraisers will take a look and possibly help unlock the story of the McMaines Muskets mystery. <laughs> Roughly 9 to 10 million people watch Antiques Roadshow each week. And just a quick glance into the Baton Rouge tour stop reveals palpable levels of excitement and anticipation. This seems like just like a kid in a candy store. It's the adult version of show and tell, it almost feels well, like. Well, it really is. That's a very good way to, uh, that's a very good analogy. It is like, it is like show and tell. I'm an auctioneer, and uh, it, it's sort of like that business. It's every day is Christmas. Because you never know when somebody in this line that's uh, in front of us walks up to your table and opens a box. We don't know what they're going to have in that box. So what are the odds of an object being selected for the broadcast? Well, it's somewhere in the range of hitting a hole in one and finding a pearl in an oyster. The Baton Rouge stop drew roughly 5,000 fans. Each person could bring up to two items for appraisal. Associate producer Jill Giles helps with the math and tells us appraisers will see. 10, 12,000 objects. And how many come out of that on tape? About 100. Yeah. So your odds are not in your favor. <laughs> <laughs> you're the person everybody wants to know, aren't you? <laughs> one of three. Of one the people of three. that everybody wants to know. Yeah. yeah. You're the one who's going to basically say yes. yes or no. Yes or, or no. no. <laughs> yeah. Jill is one of the chosen few. Her job is to make the final decision on what objects will make the cut and be recorded. Jill talks with guests. I've got a piece of Newton pottery with conditions. With conditions. Yes. Okay, I've got two of the pieces. I see the conditions. She hears pitches from appraisers. Very sophisticated, very forward thinking to be done in Louisiana by fairly young women who were just working into the arts and crafts movement. It's a very good piece of Newton Powell's pottery. And then Jill makes the call. There's so many stories to tell. So what we'd like to do is shoot this for the web. Okay. So you would go into the green room, sign the release saying that you own it, you can bring your entourage. Okay. Good. Okay. And executive producer Marsha Bemko runs to an appraiser who holds an old letter with pictures of Amelia Earhart, taken just days before she died. That's nice. So let's Last let me person to see her guests. alive, basically. It gives me goosebumps. I want to I go interview our guests and see what they say. Okay. Bob just discovered this letter 10 years ago. And I was just going through the letters, and I noticed the Java stamped. Oh, okay. And I thought, why in the world was she getting letters from Java? The letter was from a friend of his mother's. In June of 1937, that friend was staying at the same hotel as Earhart in Indonesia. But that's not all, as Bob reads a portion of the correspondence. But the most thrilling thing for me was the last day when the pilot of the Douglas passenger plane invited me to go up on a test flight as he escorted her out of Bangdong. 
We dipped and dived and waved goodbye from way up high, side to side. So I felt pretty depressed when I think of her loss now. And that was about a week later. That's so really it just powerful. sort of puts your, puts your family in, in history. It does. In history. So it gives me the chills. I yeah. think that's pretty amazing. It's hard work, but it's fun work. And, you know, we wouldn't be here if we all didn't love it and enjoy it. It's really a great job, and we have a lot of fun doing it and, and seeing what's going to turn up. You ready for your 15 minutes of fame? Honey, I've been, I'm be 68 years old next month. I've been waiting a long time for my 15 minutes. <laughs> well, I'm going to give it to you, sweetheart. Thank you, chickadee. Yeah, she's good now, Margaret. Ultimately, we're making a television show, and although we're providing a public service to five to 6,000 people here tomorrow, we want to make sure that those three episodes from Baton Rouge are terrific. <laughs> Antiques Roadshow host Mark Wahlberg has been with the popular PBS program for nine years. In addition to his studio work on the program, he is also out in the field with appraisers looking for hidden historic gems across the country. This past summer, Mark and Chris Mitchell stopped by the historic Civil War battlefield at Port Hudson. Although it's not officially part of the side story, Wahlberg is curious if park officials can fire off a cannon later in the morning. And people love cannons. Yeah. I, I, well, you know, it, it's, it does get people's attention, that's for sure. What did Rafe say the last time we did it? Oh, you can't do that with a Tiffany lamp. Yeah, we <laughs> shot out the cannon. And with this sudden accident, you can't do that with a Tiffany lamp? Is hosting Antiques Roadshow as fun as it looks? Uh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, you don't see half the fun because, you know, Antiques Roadshow is uh, education first, so normally you see me in a demeanor that's relatively serious, but... <laughs> What you don't see is that we're really like this family at summer camp, so we have a pretty good time. What's the secret behind Antiques Roadshow? Why has it been so successful for so long? Well, my theory is that for the majority of the public flipping through the channels and they stopped a roadshow, it's really about seeing that little bling at the bottom to see if the person on camera is going to be rich, and therefore, <laughs> is there a chance that I could be rich and stop working, which is the American dream. But that doesn't really argue for how the show lasts for 18 years and how you get through the hour. And what I think it is is that in the process of talking about the value of something, we take historical, scientific, uh, pop culture uh, moments that we're all aware of, mm -hmm. common knowledge, but it then connects to a family, to a person, to a human story that is relatable. And that suddenly jumps off the page. And so I, I think that that's a big reason why Antiques Roadshow um, cuts through. And then the, the really big reason is a little bit ethereal, but, and this, this applies to all of PBS. There is a truth to it, which is an ideal that we kind of self-impose, we at PBS, that we have to do it a certain way, even though from the viewer's standpoint, there's no mandate to do so. But there's, there's an air of authenticity there is a, a ring of truth that you can't really put your finger on, the, on, on what it is, but it drives viewership. People I work with have become my dear friends. Mm -hmm. and everyone from the volunteers we get in the city up to our executive producer, the appraisers, the staff, the crew, they're in it for something bigger than just a paycheck. I don't get to make as many jokes as I like, but uh, <laughs> well, maybe, you did, that's, maybe you, that's best for the show. Well, you did for this segment, so you got that going for you. Well, for Which this segment. Nice. Which yeah. is nice. Yes, but you'll cut it out. No, we're going <laughs> to keep it. Be careful. We definitely will keep it. <laughs> Mark Wahlberg, thank you so much for, one, being in Louisiana. Happy thank to you, be here. And thank you for being on LPB. Thanks for having me. And uh, I'm just waiting for you to invent a reason to invite me back. <laughs> that won't be hard. No. <laughs> Whether it's working on the front lines with the Antiques Roadshow production crew or corralling the throngs of antique toting visitors coming to the Baton Rouge River Center or just making you feel welcome. Roughly 120 local volunteers are the backbone to success in any of the Antiques Roadshow tour stops. They will work the front of the set. They will work the back of the set. They will help with taking notes. We have them assigned all over, and as a matter of fact, we used to use 100 volunteers. 
the jobs expanded, 110. Now we're at 120. The volunteers are the face that everybody's going to see tomorrow. They won't really see much of the crew and staff, so the volunteers are going to be the, the first front to the public and the people who are coming in. One of those volunteers is Sarah Simmons of Walker. I see you waving uh, down people. Yes, we're triage, so our goal is to make everybody come to us so that we can help them find the best spot to wait in line. Or not wait in line, because we know where some of the short ones are. Why did you volunteer? Uh, mostly because I adore LPB, and I wanted to support them, and it's one of my favorite shows. And so this was a way to do it. As part of the volunteer program, workers get a complimentary breakfast and lunch, but just as important, each volunteer can bring up to a pair of items to be viewed by the appraisers. Everybody's just having a good time getting to know each other and see each other's stuff, and it's, it's been a blast. Everybody's very been pumped up about it. Welcome back to our exclusive behind the scenes look into Antiques Roadshow during the summer 2013 tour in Baton Rouge. What will appraisers say about Barbara Sims' vintage album collection from Sun Records? And will the mystery of Chuck McMain's musket reveal it actually came from the Battle of New Orleans? Those answers and many more stories unfolded on that big Saturday in July at the Baton Rouge River Center. After months of anticipation, the Antiques Roadshow Caravan rolled into Baton Rouge for its sixth stop on an eight-city summer tour. Thousands of fans of Antiques and the Roadshow lined up to find out if they were hauling trash or treasure. If you could carry it, drag it, or roll it, appraisers would take a look. But there was one item that caught everyone's attention. And she was not the only one asking Ann and Rudy Bachman of New Roads. What in the world is this? Well, that's why we're here. <laughs> I don't exactly it. know. There's a, a burner you can put where you can put wood, wood in. in there, and and then, then, then there's a hole somewhere yeah, you pipe where out. you could pipe it. But I've been having it for 18 years and it's been sitting on the porch. It's just pretty. And it headed to the porcelain and pottery line for an evaluation. Stay tuned to see if Ann and Rudy will get rich quick. Another head-turning item early in the day came from Robert and Rhonda of Baton Rouge with an autographed football. I brought in a ball that uh, I got out of a storage locker that we own and, uh, about 30 some odd years ago. And I've just been having it sitting up in my closet. It did not take long for appraisers to jump on the loose ball and reveal just exactly what's been hidden away. An official NFL football signed by the Super Bowl II champion Green Bay Packers. Vince Lombardi, Vince Jimmy Lombardi, Taylor. Jimmy Taylor, Bart Starr, uh, Paul Horney. She was going up, but she said the, the special one was just Henry Jordan. He's very special. He, he adds several hundred dollars onto the ball. So, so what did they tell you? They said it was worth three to five thousand dollars. I can't believe it. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Now I'm gonna put it. She said I got to put it in a glass or plastic case and still keep it out of sunlight. But I may display a little bit more prominently than in the closet. <laughs> These are just a few of the thousands of possible storylines producers at Antiques Roadshow reviewed on this particular Saturday in July. Earlier in the show, you met Antiques Roadshow fans Chuck and Barbara, who both had some living history to share. Barbara is a retired LSU English professor who worked at Sun Studio writing liner notes before she moved to Louisiana. Her Sun record collection included rare albums of Elvis, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Johnny Cash. And Chuck is a former Louisiana lawmaker with a 200-year-old British musket he had hoped came from the Battle of New Orleans. The markings down here would be regimental markings, but there, I don't believe there was a 10th regiment at the Battle of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So he said, though, that these things would get swapped around a good bit. Okay. So that very well could be what happened. Okay. So it's, um, it's appropriate for the period, but no guarantees on anything. And he said the value between $1,500 and $2,000 probably. So the mystery continues in some ways. Yes. And some things have been answered. Absolutely. 
Appraiser Lee Dunbar spent a good deal of time looking over Barbara's record collection. But for, you know, what I can see here, Barbara, you know, for you, the sun rises every day. <laughs> exactly. The main value is that I have loved music and really have been a part of it. If I was going to put an auction estimate on here, I'd put 5000 to 10000 And the reason being is that it, you have a lot of unusual, early, rare records, and you have fantastic provenance because you were there. Um, without looking through them all, but looking through some, they have been played. And condition does affect value in regard to that. I eavesdrop a little, and uh -huh. I heard uh, you're playing your albums too much, huh? I do play them quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what albums are for, too. You well, have to enjoy it them. it me a lot of pleasure. So at the time that I uh, was taking them home, I never thought that I was going to auction them all sometime. Exactly. And exactly. May, may never do so. Which brings us full circle to that big yellow and white thing. After waiting for a couple of hours, Ann and Rudy finally got an answer. He said it's a heater. They would use, have used it inside a, a home. And, you know, put the wood in there, and then there's a hole where the exhaust could go inside the, you know, someone's room or whatever. And it's a rococo style, which is, means, you know, it means it's really pretty. <laughs> and, um... It is really pretty. I, I think I'm gonna keep it on the porch. He said at auction it would bring anywhere from three to five thousand. But then you know it depends on maybe somebody might want it even more. I don't know. But whatever the value, whatever the story, millions of fans have been watching Antiques Roadshow for 18 years. How in the world did you pick Baton Rouge? I like to joke we throw dots, but it was much more scientific than that. Um, but this is our first time in Baton Rouge. And the last time we were in Louisiana was in 2001 when we were in New Orleans. Right. So it's time you're overdue for a visit. And as we sit here in this facility here, this big and beautiful facility, we need 80 to 100,000 square feet of space or we can't conduct the event. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, there are states who do not have a facility like this. Mm. So you qualify on a very boring note. You have a place where we can do the event. On a more exciting note, we gotta get to Baton Rouge. How has this program been so successful for so long? It's a smart reality show that you are not gonna watch Roadshow uh, for a whole season and not learn when the Civil War happened. Mm -hmm. It's impossible not to learn something about our country and ourselves while you watch the show. You have an army of appraisers. How many appraisers do you have? We do have an army of appraisers and thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> there are a pool of about 150 we work with mm -hmm. and we assign about 70 to each city. They have rock star status. They have rock star status. They have groupies. I think what's so interesting <laughs> is whether the appraiser is male or female. 40 or in their 70s. They have groupies. All of them. And this I did not know coming in. And they volunteer to come on Antiques Roadshow. It takes a village to make an Antiques Roadshow. So not only do, the, do we um, not pay their way, not pay their hotel nights, we do not pay for their time. We give them breakfast and lunch on Saturday plus nine to 10 million viewers a week. So that, that there is some return on their investment. The production schedule, this sounds nuts. The production schedule sounds nuts, you know why? Because <laughs> it is nuts. <laughs> what is it, June, July, August to shoot eight cities That's right. for an entire season. That's right. And we better capture it all while we're out here because we don't have any money to come back and get a little bit that we missed. Mm -hmm. um, so the summers are um, taxing. What about the people I'm sure this doesn't happen. What about the people who might stretch the truth a little bit? How do you know they're necessarily stretching the truth or not? You don't always know when someone's stretching the truth. And someone will tomorrow. It happens in every city. Because they want to tell us what they think we want to hear. But most of the time, I have to tell you, we're good at it. We catch you. We'll ask the kind of questions where you don't realize what we're really asking and you'll reveal something. And no, I'm not going to tell you what those questions are. It's our secret. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be six digits. It doesn't have to be seven digits. It's the story. It's the story because mm -hmm. I've turned down six-figure objects where the guest knows everything. We've seen an object like that before. 
and I don't want to see another dragonfly Tiffany lamp. I don't want to see it. Do you? <laughs> I'm done. So I haven't seen near as many as you, but <laughs> yes. Well, we. But I understand the point. <laughs> we're paid to be jaded. We're paid to be your your sieve, and um, and so yeah, we won't. It's not just about the money. <laughs> I'm from New Orleans, and. Beth, tell me a little bit about this bow. Well, this is a Hawaiian calabash. And um, we lived in Hawaii uh, in the 50s, before it was a state. And it was given, I think, to my mother and father. And my father just passed away last year at 99. And so this is one of the things I inherited. And I know virtually nothing about it other than we used to put Christmas cards in it. And I put a plant in it. Okay, well you're right, it is Hawaiian, and um, they do call them calabashes there, the Hawaiian calabashes. This is a bowl that's been made entirely by hand. Um, later on, after the 1860s, they were starting to make them on a lathe, but this is entirely by hand, and it's a long process. Um, this bowl also is, well, the date-wise, it's pretty early. I think it's probably either late 18th century, but definitely early 19th. And to be conservative, I'd probably say um, 1820 to 1840, the time of Kamehameha II and the Third. It's pretty rare, I bet. But the other wonderful thing about it is the thinness of the lip. It's really a beautiful thin lip on this. But the other thing is the profile. Quite often, the Hawaiian bowls, they rise up either side and they sort of stop like that. But this one, as you can see, it actually goes up and inclines slightly, which is really delicate and really wonderful. Um, pricing of the bowl, have you any idea? I have absolutely no idea. Okay. I think conservatively, this bowl, even though the condition isn't as good as it could be, I would say conservatively twenty to $22,000. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's amazing. I think so. A real treat for me because we see a lot of bowls, and they're fairly normal, utilitarian things, but this is really special. For nearly two decades, Antiques Roadshow has kept millions of viewers on the edge of their living room couches, wondering just what will be the next big find. But thanks to our exclusive look behind the scenes, you have also found out just how they produce one of the most popular shows on PBS year after year. Everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting wishes to thank WGBH in Boston and the entire production team of Antiques Roadshow for allowing our cameras to go behind the scenes. And we look forward to more great episodes to come, especially the ones from Louisiana. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.